In The Evil Within 2, when you arrive at the third chapter following a heavily scripted first opening hour, you're met with a surprise. A small open world to explore. Horror games are rarely associated with that type of level design. Most of them are linear, moody, atmospheric pieces that serve as a backdrop for jump scares and spooky images. And as much as I love these types of games, I do believe they hold the potential to be much more unique and interesting in their approach. And today, I want to share with you guys why I think open world design could be the key to great horror games. You see, the reason why games are usually scarier than movies is obviously because of the fact that they are interactive pieces of entertainment. Instead of watching a character opening a door, you're the one turning the knob, entering into the unknown. But what if that simple choice of opening a door or not was applied to the house itself? Now what if you could completely skip that house because you're afraid of what you might find inside or because you don't have enough ammo to confront whatever creature might be waiting for you? Well, you would get an open world horror game. Obviously not the kind of massive open world that gives you a laundry list of things to do. No, I'm talking about the smaller kind that would be used as a tool of tension and mystery. Open world games are all about freedom. They reward curiosity and encourage the players to go off the beaten path for various reasons, whether it's to collect valuable pieces of gear, collectibles, resources, or simply to tell an optional storyline. And when you mix that type of game design with horror, that's where things start to get interesting, because in those games there's an additional barrier between the player and the possible reward. Fear. The same type of fear you would get when having to go inside the basement as a child. These games trade the feeling of adventure and wonder for a feeling of uneasiness, as if danger was lurking around every corner. Therefore, the open world not only encourages curiosity, but it also rewards courage. Every time you decide to explore a location in an open world horror game, you feel like you're actually trespassing, which rarely happens in a scripted scenario. You get this maybe I shouldn't be here type of feeling, which increases the feeling of dread but also make the world feel much more alive and tangible. Recently, you can find that design approach in the downtown Seattle level of The Last of Us Part 2. This is by far the most open level of the whole entire game with stores to break into and abandoned buildings to explore. With the only main objective of finding gas for a generator, you will most likely want to see at least a couple of optional locations, hoping to find the tools necessary for survival or interesting pieces of lore. But there's also one lingering question that goes along with that desire. What awaits inside those places? Are you gonna stumble on a horde of infected, or maybe bandits have set up traps? All those questions make the world feel hostile, scary, and unexpected, which most likely wouldn't work as well in the context of a linear game. And that idea of blending open level design with fear can be found in a bunch of open world games, even non-horror ones. Like that creepy house in Red Dead Redemption 2, the subway tunnels of Fallout 3, or even the encounter with the Man Bat in Arkham Knight. The feeling of surprise you get in those particular instances is so much greater simply because of the fact that they happen as you naturally explore the world. Now imagine a game being entirely based around that. Which brings me back to The Evil Within 2. The game is divided into 17 chapters, and two of them are small open worlds. You have main story objectives, but aside from those, you are free to explore the town's various buildings. There's a church, a tourist center, an abandoned train, a park, a restaurant, and a bunch of houses and alleyways. No matter what you decide to do, there's an underlying sense of suspense constantly following you around, which turns every single step you take into an act of survival. The need for resources and ammunition is usually enough to give the players an incentive to explore, but in this case, curiosity goes above the simple need for stuff to collect. Anyone who's watched a horror film once in their life has most likely said out loud at least once, don't go in there. Characters have a very bad tendency to explore the darkness instead of running away, and that is actually a completely normal human response. We want answers to things we don't understand, even when it's dangerous, and horror games take full advantage of that phenomenon. But it's only when you have a controller in your hands or mouse and keyboard that you start to understand the character motivations in horror films, because you too want to find out what lies in that creepy basement. Even if a part of you would just like to get the hell out of that place, your curiosity will most likely get the best of you. And The Evil Within 2 is built on that very idea. It uses a bunch of tricks like side missions and signals you can pick up with your radio to guide you throughout its world and to lead you to interesting scenarios. But even then, it's completely up to you if you want to investigate these optional locations or not. And that choice is at the center of why this game works so well. 
But if there is one single instance where this idea is masterfully showcased is when you first encounter the ghost lady in chapter 3. It's when this moment happened that I truly understood the potential of open world horror. As I was exploring one of the main streets, I saw a pale silhouette standing under a street light. Already this is creeping me out. I slowly head towards the mysterious lady when suddenly my radio lights up. doesn't sound like any of the other ones. Obviously, I decide to investigate the signal coming from 336 Cedar Avenue. At this point, you can actually get rid of that old lady if you want, but that's not what I did. Instead, I chose to create a distraction and proceeded to sneak inside the house. Everything looked normal, a typical suburban home, until I got to the bathroom. Here I found the dead body of a woman, most likely the one I heard pleading for help on the radio, which means that whatever got to her must be nearby. So I continue to investigate when this happens. And as you all know, flashing lights are no good. I open the nearest door and find a chair that has been knocked down and a journal sitting on a table. happening. Alright, it's time to leave, I head towards the door and that's when things start to go south. What the? And just like that, I'm back at Beacon Hospital, the main location of the first game. But this time, I'm being chased around by this scary ghost lady who's singing me a song through my controller speaker. Yep, you heard me correctly. If you're playing this on a PlayStation console, the creature's voice is actually coming out of your controller. The first time this happened, I nearly pooped my pants. It was as if the monster was actually coming for me inside my own home. To this day, I still consider this one of the best, if not the best, use of the DualShock speaker. After picking up a keycard following a little stealth sequence, I run towards the exit door as the ghost lady is creeping up behind me and suddenly I'm back at the house on Cedar Avenue. You're left thinking, what the hell just happened? That ghost lady actually haunts you throughout the whole entire game. It's not random like Mr. X in Resident Evil 2, but still, you might be casually walking down the street when out of nowhere you start hearing her creepy voice inside your controller. But that first encounter is truly what I'll remember the most about this game. What makes that moment as good as it is, is the fact that it's completely optional. It happened not because the game told me to explore that house, but simply because I had to know what was behind that door. In some ways, curiosity wasn't rewarded, but punished, with one of the creepiest and chilling moments in recent memory. And that's exactly why I think, when done right, open world and horror are meant to be together. Thank you guys so much for watching this special video. If you've been following me since the very beginning, this doesn't come to you as a surprise. I basically started with essays on my favorite video games, and as far as I can tell, it's still the channel tagline. By doing this video, I also realized that I really, really like talking about specific moments in games and try to understand their design and how they work, so I'm definitely going to do more of these in the future. Next up on the list is Little Nightmares 2. I'm a big fan of the first one, so you can definitely expect a review for it. If you enjoy my content, please drop a like and subscribe for more. I'll see you all in the next video.